our perspective on life can have a huge impact on the way we interact with the world. And this in turn can affect the outcomes that we get and our quality of life. If you're anything like me and you tend to focus slightly too much on the negative side of things, on what might go wrong instead of what might go right, on your failures rather than your successes, then this can be quite limiting and detrimental. But don't be too hard on yourself because this has actually been programmed into us over hundreds of thousands of years. Once upon a time this negative cognitive bias might have protected us from approaching predators in the jungle, for example. But today it can be quite restrictive. So how do we reprogram ourselves? How do we, we change these kind of neural pathways to stop focusing on all the things that are negative in the world and focus on all the things that are positive? Well, one of the ways is through a practice of gratitude. Gratitude literally asks us to focus on all the things that are going well for us. And the more we do this, the more we practice this behavior, the more those neural pathways get developed and the more it becomes second nature. Just like going to the gym changes your body shape, focusing on positive things and positive outcomes changes your, your mental makeup. Now, gratitude is very zeitgeisty at the moment, but there's good reason for that, because there have been scientific studies that have shown how beneficial a practice of gratitude can be. And this is a conversation I wanted to have with someone who knows all about it, so I reached out to AJ Jacobs. AJ is a, a multi-best-selling author, and his most recent book is called Thanks a Thousand, where he set out to thank everybody involved in the creation of his morning cup of coffee. Now, coffee is something that most of us just drink and forget about, just like many other things in life. You know, we use cutlery every day. I'm talking on a laptop, but little thought actually goes into what got this laptop in front of me, what got this cutlery into my hand. So AJ set out to thank everybody. He thanked the farmers who grew the beans. He thanked the truck drivers who delivered the beans to the distribution center. He thanked the tasters who taste the flavor of the beans, the people who create the logos for the coffee cups, the lids, and everyone else involved in the cup of coffee. But as he kept thanking more people, he found there were more people to thank. Gratitude literally revealed to him that we are all connected. And not only that, something as simple as a cup of coffee through practicing gratitude suddenly becomes such a much more significant item. You suddenly become aware of everything that went into making it. Your world literally gets bigger. So I spoke to AJ about gratitude and the wonderful things it can do for us in a conversation that really opened my eyes to just how powerful it is. And I hope after listening to this, you will find things in your day to be grateful for. So AJ, um, I guess the best way to start the podcast is just to say thank you, um, because uh, I guess that's what your your last book was all about. It was about um, uh, gratitude, really. I mean, you you sought to track down all the people involved in making your your cup of coffee, um, and uh, yeah, by the sounds of things, uh, it was hard to know when to stop, really, because you could have potentially thanked everyone on earth by the sounds of right. things. It could have been a lifelong pursuit. I had to kind of limit myself. Yeah, but to respond, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to, uh, to the inventor of Zoom and the people who make your microphone and your glasses, which I guess you couldn't read your notes without your glasses. Well, exactly. <laughs> this is it. Um, and the reason I, I got in touch with you is because um, I was reading uh, Sharon Salzberg's book uh, one of her books loving kindness the revolutionary art of happiness and she was talking about how um when we see things as they truly are we see them in in great depth and it made me think about your book a thousand uh, thanks a thousand because you you know we, we normally just drink our coffee and then you know throw the cup in the bin but you sought to thank everybody who was involved in making your cup of coffee and i guess suddenly you saw your coffee in a, in a new depth. And yeah. I guess this has opened up life to you a little bit more. It's made things a bit more, um, a bit more textured and, and detailed than they might've been otherwise. Absolutely. I mean, it definitely was a perspective changer in a big way because the project made me realize the hundreds of th people I take for granted in every 
every object in my house. It didn't have to be coffee, but it could be, you know, the stapler or, or you know, as I say, your glasses. But it takes hundred, uh, hundreds of people to make it, uh, make anything happen. Uh, and I, I saw this firsthand because I thanked everyone who had even the smallest role in my cup of coffee. So I thank the barista. And of course, I live in New York and it was at a cafe in New York. I went down to South America and I thank the farmers, but I also thank everyone in between who are largely invisible. So the, the person who drove the truck with the coffee beans in it, uh, but the person who designed the logo for the cafe, uh, the person uh, who, who paved the road so the truck could drive on the road. I mean, as you said earlier, you could take it, you know, I, the truck driver told me he listened to Beyonce to stay awake. So I, I did place a call to Beyonce to thank her for her music. That one did not get a response, but, uh, you know, maybe I'm still waiting. Who knows? Maybe she's uh, soon going to find some time to call. I know, but, uh, a bit ungrateful of her not to respond to your, your, your message, really. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I am so insulted. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was a real eye opener, and I honestly, uh, it has also hit home. I did this before COVID, yeah. but it is really timely in a way because COVID made me realize all these other people uh, that I took for granted that keep our society from collapsing. Uh, so people we the the grocery workers um and of course the medical staff but uh but it wasn't it made me realize it's not just the doctors and nurses at a hospital you, you've got hundreds of other people you've got technicians who work in the x-ray and uh you've got the uh janitors you've got uh people in billing you know it it just goes on and on so it is i honestly don't know how I would have made it throughout COVID without this uh, perspective, because it's been, you know, even with this perspective, it's it's still a struggle. It's brutal. Yeah. But uh, this was sort of a, a cushion, a way for me to really adjust and, and and you know fight this negative bias that we all have, where we are really good at noticing the negative. Well, that- well, that's it. I mean, it's um, we are kind of programmed genetically to look for the worst case scenario. You know, this is mm-hmm. this goes back hundreds of thousands of years to stop us getting um, skewered by woolly mammoth tusks and trampled to death in the jungle. But these days, we we just generally have a tendency to look on the the kind of bleak side of everything. Um, and it is like you say, it's a it's a, a kind of uh, attention bias, isn't it? Um, but gratitude can help us reprogram that so that we can start to see life in a in a different way i mean do, do you feel like it has taken the edge off your your grumpiness this kind of new perspective on gratitude absolutely i mean, it's still a struggle i talk in the book how we all have two sides to our personalities uh and i use the example the the mr rogers side and the yep. larry david side so the mr rogers of course is the the optimistic, uh, grateful side, and the Larry David is, is, as you say, the grumpy, cynical side. So it's always a wrestling match between those two. But gratitude is is a great way to strengthen your Mr. Rogers side. Yeah. And uh, it is a discipline. It's not some, as you say, it's not something that comes naturally to us as humans. So you really have to work at it. It's like, you know, go into the gym, but the payoffs are huge and uh, even something I'll, I'll do things like uh, I'll just talk to myself I may look a little bit insane but I'll talk to myself almost narrating my day so I'll press the elevator button and be like oh uh, thanks to the elevator for coming you know get in the elevator and be oh thanks for not plummeting to the basement and breaking my collarbone uh and it's a little bit of an odd way to live, but it really drives home the hundreds of things that go right yeah. uh, every day, which is which we totally take for granted. Uh, well, this and- is it. I mean, in your in your TED talk, you said that like you know when when things work perfectly, they they become invisible. 
you know, and it's only when they go wrong that we, we kind of sit up and take notice, you know, so all day long, things are working in our favor. You know, I've got a, I ate my lunch with a fork that was designed by someone somewhere else. And they put a lot of time and effort into that fork. And I, I finish and I throw it in the sink, ready to wash it up, you know, and all of these, all of these things are just going right. But then when like, we, we can't get a signal on our phone or something like that, or we stub our toe, we're sort of cursing our lives. Thinking exactly. This is, How yeah. good the- it yeah. always happens to me. Yeah, what is wrong? Why am I cursed like this? You know, um, but gratitude is it's a funny thing. It's like it seems to have taken on this kind of spiritual um, thing at the moment. There's a lot of woo woo around it. You know, if you if you tell people you keep a gratitude journal or something like that, people kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, right. You're one of these these kind of Instagram gurus or something like that. But it's it's proven that it it can make your life better. Yeah, I mean, there's real science behind it. And I am not a very woo-woo person. Uh, I am not a reader of goop, for instance. Uh, But there is real science behind it. Lots of studies over decades about how, for instance, uh, when you keep a gratitude journal, you recover more quickly from surgery. There's there's a lot about um, gratitude making you more generous, making you sleep better. So there are all of these physical and mental health benefits. Uh, and for me personally, uh, the most convincing has just been the, my own data point that it has been for me transformative uh, in helping my navigate life because my default, as I say, is, is yeah. very grumpy, very negative, and it's always it's always a struggle to to look for what uh, what I should be grateful for. But it's a struggle worth having because yeah. it, it really does help. Um, and you were mentioning earlier uh, about all that we take for granted that's invisible, uh, and it just reminded me of. One part of the book is about water uh, because coffee is 98.8% water. It's, it's mostly water and just a little bean dust. So I felt I should thank the people who provided water. Yeah. Uh, I live in New York City. So the, our reservoir is a, is 100 miles north or so. Uh, and I went up there and it was just remarkable to see how many people it requires for me they're engineers, there's um, biologists, chemists, uh, people who wade out in the, in the middle of February into freezing water to, to test it, make sure it's safe. And uh, so the fact that I can turn this little metal spigot and get clean, drinkable water is, I, I, I would say, you know, miraculous is a yeah. loaded word, but it is on real it is unbelievable it's not true it hasn't been true for 99 percent of human history and it's still not true for billions of people around the world who have to trek for hours to get clean water so even just being aware of that uh is is a good way is it's very important to me to keep in mind do you think that there is um that opening yourself up to gratitude to gratitude and kind of trying to weave it into your kind of state of mind, if you like, and, and kind of having this practice makes your world bigger, you know, reveals, lets the world reveal itself to you. You sort of, sort of start noticing things, you know, you know, you kind of notice like, you know, just in your furniture, for example, or in the clothes you wear, suddenly you're, you're kind of much more appreciative of, of the taste of that, you know, that first sip of coffee in the morning, but also in, in just ordinary things, um, you know, the, the pot plants growing in your, in your, on your windowsill, for example, you know, you're thinking for that plant to get there, it's had to, you know, photosynthesize light from the sun. It's got to it start off as a tiny seed. Do you think life becomes much more rich and textured like that when you? I sure do. Uh, I, I mean, I would say in, in different ways too there's the way it becomes more textured and in, in realizing the crazy interconnectedness of life. So uh, as I say in the book, it, 
It doesn't take a village to make a cup of coffee. It takes the, the world uh, because there were people in China, I was thinking for the materials that created the, the coffee maker. Uh, so yeah, it, it shows how interconnected the world is. Um, uh, but as you say, it also uh, is very important for appreciating the different textures. And I have a section in the book about savoring uh, yeah. because savoring is like a close cousin of gratitude. And I have really been trying to savor more. Uh, again, it's a practice because you know our life goes by so fast. We have so much, it's hard to savor. But I'll give you a quick example of literal savoring was when I interviewed the man who, who bought the coffee beans for the store. He went around to Africa and South America and he would taste all these different coffees. And he showed me how to taste coffee like a pro, which is actually a hilarious ritual. Like you, um, you have to sip it um, and slurp it very loudly. Like uh, apparently you have to aerate the coffee uh, because there are taste buds all over your mouth on the roof of your mouth and in your cheeks. So you wanna slurp it loudly swish it around and then spit it out so you don't get overloaded. Uh, and, but the key is to just really, he would take a sip and he would let it sit on his tongue and he would say, I'm picking up hints of uh, ripe mango and cedar and, uh, and I would taste it and I'd say, I'm picking up coffee. My, this to yeah. me tastes like coffee. Uh, but because of him, I was inspired to actually try to focus on the texture and the acidity and sweetness and and I'll never be like him, but it did change. It just taking those five seconds to focus on savoring your food. It doesn't have to be food though. It could be savoring, you know, the the sunlight as you're walking down the street. Anything sense, anything with your senses, and it is. Um, I think it's so important because yeah. it's, it's such a key to happiness, finding these moments. Uh, because as I say, otherwise your life just blitz by in a second and you have nothing to hang on to. Well, this is it. It, it makes me think of mindfulness. It's another one of those kind of woo-woo things at the moment that's very trendy. Mm -hmm. But you know, mindfulness has been with us, well, the whole time, really. But it's just never been kind of a trendy thing that people who do yoga do. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, you always you always hear the phrase, you know, slow and steady wins the race. And um, I think even the the Marines have a, a, a slogan which is um, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You know, everything. I have heard that. Yeah, it's it's um, there's a lot about kind of living well is about slowing down and just being present with what you're doing right now. And I mean, you're a writer, which so I guess you have to you have to be present in the work that you do. And the, the guy who tastes the coffee has to be present in the work that he does. But often we're kind of encouraged not to be present. You know, we're always focusing on our goals and our targets and everything that comes next. I mean, is, is there a, a kind of potential for gratitude to be the kind of miracle activity that saves us from ourselves and lets us live life and be happy? Oh, I like that. Well, I think that you need a balance. You don't want to yeah. be in the moment at all times or you'll, <laughs> you'll never get anything done. Yeah, you'll never get and you'll you'll starve to death because you're not planning ahead for the next meal. So you want a balance. Um, but I do think we've gone too far in the living in the future. Uh, so and actually, I, this is I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud. So forgive me. But I think you want a balance of living in the future, of planning ahead, living in the present. So savoring that and just recognizing the amazing things. I talked in the book about how I never really thought about how wonderful my desk lamp is because it's got this little switch that perfectly fits my thumb. And uh, it's in the, this lovely groove that someone designed. So, all right, so you've got to balance planning ahead, living in the present, but I also think that um, some level of collecting wonderful experiences and remembering them is, is an important part of happiness. Uh, and I don't, there's a danger of living in the past. There's a danger of nostalgia. There's a danger of 
make America great again was a terrible, yep. uh, in my opinion, terrible way to look at life. But for instance, I have about, I, I love taking photos of my kids and, and, and our whatever trips we were used to be allowed to go to. So I have like 50,000 photos on my hard drive and I rotate them on my screensaver. And it's such a joy to, to see, oh yeah, remember when we went to that candy shop in Savannah, Georgia? Because otherwise, again, you don't, you're so focused on the present and the future that you forget these wonderful experiences. So I think this, this balance uh, is important. We're planning ahead, living in the present, and also remembering the wonderful times. It's funny because I have a two-year-old daughter and she's, um, she's going through the terrible twos at the moment. So she's um, very demanding. She's finding her boundaries and that kind of thing. <laughs> and then when she goes to bed at night, there's this kind of sense of, oh, okay, and, and relax. But the first thing I do is get my phone out and start looking at pictures of her um, from that day. So it's, it's, you know, I just can't get enough of her in a, in a strange way. But, um, but it's, it's funny, I, uh, I used to be, I mean, you, you talk about thanking the barista and the truck driver. I, I spent a year or so as a, a van driver delivering um, groceries to, to houses around the south of England. And I would often get up at half past three in the morning. And at, at the time I was pretty depressed. So I was like pretty miserable. And then someone told me about gratitude and uh, so I would, I would walk down the stairs in the morning. I'd get out of bed at half past three. I'd walk down the stairs to, to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee. And I, I tried practicing saying thank you all the time. And I was saying, thank you, thank you. And I would get to the kitchen. I'd make the coffee. And I'd think, well, what am I actually thankful for? Because I, I'm getting up at three o'clock in the morning. I'm a van driver. Life is pretty hard. And so I'd start looking for things to be thankful for. And I'd sit, I'd sit my coffee. And the first thing I think was, well, well I suppose I'm, I'm kind of thankful for my, my first cup of coffee. And suddenly, literally, my world was transformed in front of me because suddenly I started focusing in on different, different things. And I, I realized that we're, our attention bias is malleable and we are malleable. So whatever kind of state we're in, we can, we can shift that. I mean, this is something you've played with, you know, you've, you've you did the year of living biblically. You, you've kind of said that your whole life is a series of projects in a way. Um, and you've, you've dealt with radical honesty as well. Do you, uh, do you think that we need, to, we need to look at ourselves as projects and work on ourselves to kind of be better? And when, when we find things that aren't working out for us, kind of shift ourselves and practice and hone and craft ourselves? Uh, I am a fan of people experimenting more in their lives. I'm not gonna say you need to, uh, but I think it is one recipe for being happier and being more, uh, getting more done, just generally improving yourself by experimenting. And I don't recommend, you know, traveling around the world, thanking everyone who made your cup of coffee, unless you have a book contract, it's not very, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't seem that feasible. Oh, and you don't have to, I, I live by all the rules of the Bible and grew this huge beard and I wore robes. So you don't have to do that, but they can be small experiments. Uh, they can be, uh, you try a new toothpaste every month. Uh, you can try going to work and uh, take a different route to work. Uh, you can, you know, try to not gossip for a week, uh, to these little things, but see how they go. Sometimes uh, you're going to find uh, insights that stay with you for a lifetime. Uh, they might, you might find an amazing, uh, like I did, I have a, there's a toothpaste I use now that is kind of mango flavored. And I hate the taste of mint, mint, just there's something about it. But uh, so brushing my teeth is no longer this unpleasant chore. It's like, oh, it's just a little treat. So I, uh, again, I'm all for experimenting. I think in general, we don't do it enough. And we get stuck in ruts uh, that, I, and scientists will tell you about sort of the, the neural, neural ruts we create in our brains. The, the more we do something the same way, the harder it is to 
see a, a difference. So keeping our brain plastic and malleable. Uh, now I will say, because I, I am a fan of balance in most things, that you, you need a balance because there are some, some parts of life that you want to have a habit so that you don't have to think about, you know, if you had to think about every time you got in a car, all of the, you know, various tasks you had to do, that would be exhausting. So you want it to almost become second nature. So balancing that with trying new things all the time. Do you think it's, um, it requires a kind of certain amount of humility, a kind of self-awareness, because there, there is a lot of and you see it on the internet and, and I try not to look at the internet, but I, it's one of those things I, I dare not look, but I can't look away because, you know, you've got one side over here and they're like, we're right and you're wrong. And then the other guys over here, we're right and you're wrong, but nobody's prepared to seem to say, well, hang on, maybe I am wrong. Maybe there are things I need to change about myself. And, you know, that, that kind of telling people that they need to work on themselves is a bit, um, you know, you, you're asking for a fight, really, if you say, well, actually, you might be the one in the wrong here. Have you thought about looking at yourself? Uh, there do seem to be tribes of people who, some people who will work on themselves and other people who just get offended at the, the notion that there might be something not quite right with the way they do things. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is a, such an important value, is the value of, of humility and epistemic humility, uh, meaning, you know, I, uh, there's so much I don't know. There's so much I'm not sure of. Uh, and I'm always willing to look for evidence. I think it's a good way to go through life is, is looking for evidence that contradicts what you believe because it, it keeps you, uh, it keeps your mind uh, more active and, and it keeps you from let, let having these beliefs that are just so stuck that you can't move them. And actually that is, um, my new book is all about puzzles and my love of puzzles. Uh, so I talk about all sorts of kinds of puzzles like uh, crossword, jigsaw, logic, riddles. Uh, but I also try to almost have a, a view of life as a big puzzle. Uh, or a view of interacting with other people as a puzzle. For instance, if I'm arguing with a, a Trump supporter, uh, one way to approach it would be a, a battle. Like I'm trying to crush him or her and she's trying to crush me uh, and zero sum game. Uh, another metaphor might be a puzzle. I, I am trying to figure out why does this person believe what they believe? And what can be done about it? Is there any evidence that I could present or any tactics I could use to, to sway them? Uh, so I find that much more productive. It's much better for my mental health because otherwise I'd be angry every moment of the day, just, you know, uh, because saying, how can a hundred million people believe in, you know, QAnon, whatever it is. Uh, so, having this more gentle, humble, and curious view of the world. I need it for my, my own mental health. Do you think we're encouraged to be angry and to, be, to take sides? Do you think that's kind of how this material commercial world that we're living in needs us to be in order to operate? Well, I think that certainly in the information ecosystem, the articles or videos that make you angry are the ones that we are most drawn to and the ones that are most shared. So yeah, there's sort of an outrage, um, uh, you know, a bias towards outrage uh, because it's, it's clickbait, yeah. uh, and, but it's not good for the world at large. It's good for, uh, you know, getting more clicks uh, so that more people see your hair loss advertisement, but it is not good for the mental health of the world. So maybe that's a that's a puzzle worth considering. Then how can we? And I've, I've thought about this a lot. You know, we have a media which profits from people being angry and and divided. Is there a way of of 
flipping that on its head and maybe using gratitude to unite people uh, in as addictive a way as um, outrage, you know. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I think gratitude and maybe um, incentivizing curiosity. So trying to tell people the, the pleasure of figuring out something that's subtle and complicated as opposed to uh, the pleasure of being angry and seeing the world as simple black and white. You know, maybe if we can uh, try to train our kids to be more interested in the, the curiosity and the subtlety and the joys of that. Uh, but it's a battle. It is an uphill yeah. battle against human nature, unfortunately. But I think it's one worth fighting. I did. I had an interview with uh, Barack Obama and he was he was no talking way. to him. Uh, a load of uh, I, I didn't interview him but it was one that I'd, I'd seen he was being interviewed by some um, young uh, politi politically uh, very savvy um, young people sort of late teens early 20s and he was saying that you know the problem we have a lot of the time is is that we we see our lives in three dimensions but we see everyone else two-dimensionally hmm. so you kind of have this this enemy this kind of republican or this democrat or this person you you see in the news and you think they're an evil person, but you know they might get up in the morning, kind of feel a bit fed up, be grumpy until they've had their coffee or whatever. They might love their children. They might, you know, kiss their wife goodbye before they go to work. And I think maybe that's what I mean. You talk in your in your TED talk about looking up and recognizing the person in front of you. And we have this kind of there's this word sonder that I like a lot which is about understanding that other people are just, you know, living detailed lives, just like you, you do. And they have the same motivations and they, they hurt when you hurt and, you know, they, they feel things just as much as you do. And we seem to have lost that. Everything seems to be very black and white, like you said. Um, but yeah. I think gratitude, you talk about it connecting you to other, other people. And, you know, you, you, you look at your cup of coffee and it's no longer just a cup of coffee. It's, it's the hard work of, hundreds of thousands of, of people potentially have gone yeah. into that and you know if we can start to see the world in that light maybe there's a there's a chance of global peace i don't know <laughs> I, mean, how can... I love it oh first of all let me just ask can can you say that word again sonder uh, how do you spell it i think it's just s-o-n-d-e-r so it's oh, one of those kind of old that. words that's been forgotten and uh and is now just about you know seeing people who, and appreciating that their lives are just as detailed as your life. And you yeah, know, they might I'm start writing there. that down. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. It is um, this us versus them and that we are uh, that, like you said, that we have, we have three dimensional lives and everyone else is a two dimensional villain. I mean, uh, it's been a theme in several of my books, this idea of, can it, the notion of interconnectivity and the fact that we're all connected, can that be a battle against this extreme yeah. us versus them uh, tribalism? Uh, so it was a theme in the gratitude book. It was a theme in a book I wrote before that called um, It's All Relative, which was about yeah. the global family tree, which is this uh, uh, extraordinary movement to try to make a family tree of everyone on earth because to, to remind people that we are actually cousins, not metaphorically, we are all cousins. The farthest cousin you have on earth is probably about a 50th cousin. Uh, and, and maybe this will nudge us to treat people with a, a little more kindness, a little more of uh, almost you know, benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, there is a sense, isn't there? I mean, we're, the world op works with this kind of polarization. But I, I've heard interviews with people like Russell Brand. He says, you know, it's time, it's not time for a political revolution, but time for a kind of spiritual revolution, if you like. And, uh, and I think Marianne Williamson tried to do it at the last, um, at the last election. She tried to kind of make a, a, a case for a kinder, more loving society. Um, right. But it's a hard sell when you've got people who are, you know, trying to get by and they're trying to kind of scrape enough together to, to, you know, look after their family. And, and you, you tell people who are going through a hard time, who've lost their jobs during COVID to be more grateful. Mm. And they're going to kind of look at you like, 
really you want me to be grateful <laughs> when i you know i can't make my mortgage payments and this kind of thing how can we how can we kind of get people motivated to be thankful i i think about that all the time and it is it's a hard problem and i don't have the answer and uh, and in a sense i do feel uh who am i to be telling people to be grateful who are in less lucky and privileged positions than i am and uh again i don't have uh, i plead epistemic humility which is uh again i don't know what is the right but uh, uh but i have interviewed people who are been in such tough positions and still are able to find some glimpse of uh, of gratitude. Uh, I had, uh, you know, even something like, you know, I'm grateful that uh, I, I have I have two arms. Uh, I'm grateful for the, just the most basic things, uh, or uh, just in any one moment, just remembering. Uh, the fact that we we live in an extraordinary age it's got huge problems uh and i don't want to downplay those uh but i would be despite covid despite um all of the challenges we face i mean i cannot imagine living 300 years ago when the life expectancy was in your mid 30s you know half of babies died and, uh, a third of women died during childbirth and it was you know every time you ate every time you drank coffee there was no government organization making sure it wasn't poisonous you know you were taking your life into your own hands it was the past was smelly it it was sexist racist beyond belief uh it was dangerous it was uh it was just a uh nothing that we should glorify so uh that's one thing i try to remind myself when uh when i even when i'm depressed and have trouble finding something to be grateful for i have a three-word mantra that i sometimes repeat to myself which is um surgery without anesthesia yeah because i did uh i did a project where i read the encyclopedia britannica from A to Z and read all of human history. And there is just so much horrific uh, life that in the past. And if you read, if you want to like stay up terrified for a couple of nights, you know, read some of these firsthand accounts of getting surgery without anesthesia and because it is just horrifying. So I do, I try to remind myself as hard as life is now, you know, we are, many of us anyway, are very lucky that yeah. we're living now instead of a thousand years ago. And I mean, this um, this last winter feels like it's been particularly hard all across the world. I mean, New York, I've, I lived in New York for a while. It gets very, very cold mm. and the winters go on for forever and it can get very bleak down there. So when the first kind of sunshine of spring comes down, um, and warms your your face as you go out the front door there's already something to be thankful for you know um and I, I, you know there's that that saying isn't there that, who was it? it was thomas edison you know he he failed ten thousand times to make the light bulb but he said you know i've not failed ten thousand times i've just found ten thousand ways that don't work <laughs> uh, and and then eventually he got there and and i think tim ferris as well he says that uh, whenever anything goes wrong he says great you know, because he's, he's found something that doesn't work. So now he can get on with finding something that um, that works out for him. I guess we have to be quite tough about this and, and kind of check ourselves when we're when we're feeling like everything is going wrong. We have to really make an effort to kind of say, well, hang on a minute. I've got clean water here. I've got sunshine. I've got, you know, roof over my head. Yeah. And to really shift that attitude. I mean, it is a struggle, as I say, and I still struggle. And, and also don't, you know, have self-compassion if, 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 if I don't want to, you know, that you're weak because you don't properly have gratitude and appreciate what you have because it's hard and I still, I still fight it. But uh, I do think it is one of the most important uh, 
things we can try to do, which is try to struggle against the negative bias. Yeah. Uh, and then I heard along the lines of those, the Thomas Edison, Tim Ferriss, what was it? I was, uh, I was on a, a podcast recently where the, the host said something like, there is no, um, there's not success and failure, there's success and learning. So you don't, you don't fail, you are learning. Yeah, and it's funny, it's um, like you, like you said in your TED talk, you know, you can have a hundred um, nice words or a hundred successes, mm. but it's always that one that goes wrong or that one negative comment that sticks with you and kind of makes you feel like a complete failure. When actually, you know, we've survived a hundred percent of our worst days so far, and we should be, <laughs> we should be thankful for that. Right. Well, yeah, and it is. I mean, I spend time thinking about how can I fight this bias where I hear a hundred nice things and then one insult and I remember the insult. And a lot of it sometimes is just really making an effort to notice. So for instance, if I'm at the pharmacy or drugstore, I don't know what you, what, yeah. what it's called over chemist. there. Yeah. Chemist, there you go. Yeah. If I go to the chemist and um, I'm in a, uh, and there are five lines and I choose one that's the shortest uh, and it goes actually fast. I really say to myself, and you know, remember this, AJ, remember that you were in the line that only took two minutes because if I don't, I know that next time I'm in the line that takes 15 minutes, I will tell myself this story. I always choose the wrong yeah. line. I'm in the worst line. Why do I have such bad luck? And I don't, it's just, that's what I remember because we are good at remembering the annoying parts of life. Do you ever set yourself up with things to be grateful for? So, you know, you, you set up your coffee machine last thing at night so that it's ready for you in the morning and you can sort of say, uh, I'm really pleased I did that. Thank you to, to yesterday me for preparing my coffee machine or, you know, do you, do you engineer s s scenarios you can be grateful for? Oh, that's a lovely idea. I should do that more. I, mean, I do try to, in general, engineer my life. I try to realize that uh, my, my environment affects me a tremendous amount. So something as simple as hiding the sugary treats on the highest shelf so I don't see them every time I go into the pantry or you know, putting my sneakers right next to my bed so that when I get up, I actually do put on my sneakers because I find I'm all about uh, micro goals. So yeah. if I find if I, because uh, I do try to get 10,000 steps on my treadmill every day, uh, but I find if, uh, if I say, oh, I'm going to get 10,000 steps, not, that never happens. But if I say, I'm just going to put on my sneakers and then uh, we'll see what happens. You put on your sneakers, you get a little momentum. And then I say, well, I'll just go on the treadmill for two minutes. I can do that. Then you get on for two minutes. You say, hey, you know what? I'm okay here. I'll stay on for another 15. So I suppose that's uh, a cousin of what you were talking about. Yeah. That uh, setting setting up your environment. But but I love that idea of, of uh, setting up things you're grateful for have you have you found success with that yeah i mean I've, i read a book years ago called um i think it's called the seven something like the seven um characteristics of highly effective people or the seven habits of highly effective people by um stephen covey yeah. and he talks about um this quadrant of of um kind of activity so some are some are um urgent but not important some are urgent and important and some are not important at all. Um, but you want to be in this this kind of second quadrant where mm. you're doing things that they're not urgent, but they are important. Mm. Um, so that what that does is it, it moves you away from dealing with crises. Mm. So a crisis is urgent and important. And that's where we that's where disorganized people tend to hang out. So they're always mm. firefighting and always dealing with, you know, last minute things because they haven't prepared properly or, you know, they're trying to grab a coffee as they're going out the door because they've overslept and they didn't set an alarm the night before. So this kind of second quadrant, quadrant two, is where you, you do the important stuff, but you do it ahead of time. 
And so you're never late for a meeting. You know, you always plan your route the night before. It can become a little bit obsessive and you can start to kind of over plan for stuff. But when it works out, you kind of think, yeah, actually, I'm I'm winning at life here. I've got I'm, I'm very <laughs> I'm thankful for myself for being so clever and so um, so witty and, and kind of, you know, with my planning and everything, you know, it's it's, it's kind of a nice place to be. But it can become obsessive. You need, do need that balance. I think you're right. Definitely. I like um, that. Yeah, that, that uh, you know, uh, trying to incorporate that. I actually do think it is helpful to, uh, there are some studies that show when you are more aware and paying more attention to your future self, that you act in healthier ways, that you, uh, that you, are, that you save more money, for instance, um, and, uh, or that you exercise more. And so for, I wrote a book about health, the mental and physical health, trying to be the healthiest person alive was the, uh, it was called drop dead healthy. But one of the techniques I used was I took this as literally as possible. And I, I did, had a software program that digitally aged my face so that I looked like I was, you know, 80 years old and I printed it out and put it over my desk. And I would, I would remember, I'd say, I try to remember to treat my future self like a friend, like I would treat someone else, you know, have some respect uh, for this person. And uh, so um, then if I were faced with a decision, you know, should I have another Cheeto or should I maybe, you know, get on the treadmill for two minutes? I would say, well, as a favor to my future self, I'm going to yeah. do this. And, and I did find it a good motivator. That is a, a nice way of looking at it. There's a there's a guy called James Clear. You probably know he he wrote a book called Atomic Habits. Oh yeah, yeah. And he talks about and uh, uh, there are loads of books like this. There's another book, uh, Slight Edge, by Jeff Olson, where they talk about you know doing things that you know we're constantly moving forward, but our, the quality of our decisions affects where we're going to be in the next moment, and the moment after that, and the moment after that. So you make a good decision now, and you'll you'll be in a better place to make a better decision later. Whereas if I have that one last beer before I hit the road now, I'm going to have a terrible hangover tomorrow. And that's, you know, I'm heading downwards rather than, than upwards. Um, and I won't have anything to be grateful for at the end of it. But, um, but there's one last thing I want to sort of touch on if it's, uh, if it's possible is, is the whole fake it until you feel it thing. Because um, when you, when I saw that on your Ted talk, um, it reminded me of another uh, a thing from Seth Godin recently he was talking also about how our actions can um, change our beliefs you know we we work hard on kind of trying to change our perspective and using gratitude to um, shift our, our kind of attention bias into a more positive state but this whole idea of kind of using action itself to to kind of change those beliefs and encourage good behaviors and this whole kind of faking it and be acting like the person you want to become um, I mean, you must have done research into this and and looked into it in quite. Some oh yeah, time. I have found that has been a running theme through many of my books: the importance of how action affects your thoughts, how the exterior affects the interior. Uh, and a quote I love by the founder of Habitat for Humanity: He said once, um, "It's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking." than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. And I love that. And I've, I've seen it on myself. Uh, so for instance, with the book about the Bible, uh, I had to do a lot of crazy things like growing a huge beard. And I, I decided to try to stone adulterers because that's in the Bible. And I, I used very small stones. I used pebbles. So so, so those were sort of the weirder parts of that experience. But there were also parts about trying to be a better person. So someone who doesn't lie or gossip as much and who's more compassionate. And I, I was faced with the question, how do you do a moral makeover? How do you make yourself better? And one big strategy I used was this idea of faking, of pretending, of acting as if I was a good person. So uh, I had a friend in the hospital, for instance, and I hate the hospital. I hate hospitals. I guess a friend in hospital, you would say there. No, the. 
uh, over in Britain. So I had a friend in hospital and I, I hated, I was like, but I said to myself, what would a good person do with it? That good person would visit their friend in hospital. Yeah. So I, uh, I forced myself to do it. And it was almost as if your mind catches up with your behavior. I saw myself, oh, I'm here at the hospital. I'm visiting a friend. And I did it repeatedly to really just let it um, sink in. And, and, and it did, it changed my mind. It, my, it sort of tricked my brain in a good way uh, to say, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I guess I am kind of compassionate and you become a little more compassionate for real. So I am a big fan of, uh, of that, of pretending to be fearless when you're filled with fear, pretending to be optimistic, acting as if you're optimistic when you are filled with self-doubt. Uh, now, uh, again, for balance, there are dangers to this. You don't want to be uh, completely self-delusional and say, you know, I can, I can be the greatest president of all time, even though I have absolutely no uh, qualifications. So, you know, it's got its dangers and downsides. But uh, I do believe it's it's an important tool for making yourself better. Yeah, I think there's this whole, you know, we have a, a lot of people have this kind of imposter syndrome, but they're capable people. But it's uh, just they're lacking confidence. And it's, you know, the capability is there to do stuff. But we, we tend to kind of fear uh, trying and failing or fear what people might think. Um, and we just need that courage to kind of get over it. Do you, do you think there's a way that being more grateful in the way we go about our day-to-day -day, um our day-to-day -day lives can help us find the courage to kind of step into who we actually are and what our capabilities are well maybe one idea is to be grateful for failure as i think you said tim ferris mentioned you know realizing you know what? I'm, I'm thankful i tried that because i learned something so not being as afraid of failure um, because, you know, the 90, you know, I, my failure ratio, especially early on was, you know, 98% failure. I pitched 98 articles. I pitched a hundred articles and 98 of them would be rejected or I would, um, uh, you know, call 50 people for an interview and 49 would say no just realizing that failure is, is such an integral part of everything I'm trying to be you know perversely be a little grateful for it because without without the failures you'll never learn yeah absolutely well, i think um we're coming up to sort of the end of our our time um but uh so i just want to say thank you again so your, your book is called um a thousand uh, thank you a thousand isn't it and um, right. yeah, very uh, interesting look at how basically we're, we're all connected and the, the things we take for granted um, actually represent a whole lot more kind of effort. And, and um, going back to that, that kind of uh, chapter I was reading in, in Sharon Salzberg's book, you know, it's about loving kindness. When you start to kind of appreciate the world and appreciate, you know, the, the things, the grass we walk on every day, the, the sun we, we step out into when we leave our homes, the, the cup of coffee and all the work that's gone into it. Life can become a, a very magical thing, I guess. And, uh, and I think your book highlights that in a, in a very non uh, kind of woo woo way. And um, I think more people need that in their lives. So, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for the, the hard work you've done uh, in, in doing that for, for all the, the people who are going to read that book. And, oh, my pleasure. And thank you for your podcast and, uh, for inviting me on and, and for uh, who, Ben Franklin for helping to discover electricity and all that. It's been a delight. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So there we go. Who would have thought that just being grateful for the small things in life could have such a powerful impact on the quality of our lives and our, our sense of connectedness to everything around us and everyone around us. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with AJ. Uh, if you want to find out more about him and his work, you can visit his site, that's www.ajjacobs.com. 
And if you want to find out more about my work, my books, my writing, more episodes of this podcast, just visit my site. That's www.chrisbrock.uk. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. We've got loads more lined up. I'm going to be speaking to Tanya Markle, for example. I've got Jeff Krasno uh, coming on the show. And um, wherever you get your podcast, don't forget to rate it and uh, subscribe. Leave a nice review if you liked it. If you didn't like it, maybe just don't don't do anything. Don't tell anyone that you didn't like it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you will stay tuned for the next conversations that we've got coming up. See you next time. Mm-hmm.